Hey everybody out there, you're tuned in to 91.8 The Fan. You're in my corner and I have a very special guest in the corner. Well, technically two. Would you guys like to unveil your secret identity to the masses? Sure. Hello, travelers! This is David Eddings with Gearbox Software and I'm also known as the voice of Claptrap and TK Baja. <laughs> I don't have anything fancy like that to introduce <laughs> myself with. Well, this is Chris Failer, then. How about that? How about yes. I introduce you? There you go. I'm a product manager and community manager over at Gearbox Software. Well, we're very happy to have you on. I actually just found out it was a dual interview, so I'm very happy to talk with two wonderful gentlemen today. And it was also a pleasure to meet you, David, at Yomacon last year. Well, it was a pleasure to meet you, too. Now I that really enjoyed that experience, by the way. That was the first time that I had ever been to Yomacon. And I met so many amazing people there, including you and Chris and... Uh, it was just a fantastic experience, so much so that I actually was just in Detroit again for the uh, Midwest Media Expo, where I was a guest of the, that very, their very first um, uh, show. Uh, and it was also an amazing experience. I hope to be back to Yomacon at the, uh, at the end of October. And we hope to see you back at Yomacon. That is one of our favorite conventions of the year. We gave away tickets for Midwest Media Expo. Sadly, we couldn't make it. I would have loved to see your, your face again and gotten to uh, party with you guys because you guys are good at partying. Well, you know, maybe too good. I don't know if you know what happened uh, after I got back home from the last uh, uh, trip to Detroit the, from Yomacon. Um, I, uh, I got back from Yomacon and immediately went to the hospital where I was for 21 days dying. Yeah, I saw the Facebook post. That seemed so scary. You must have you must have been worried about conventions ever since. <laughs> you know, I, at, in the beginning, I really didn't know what was going on. Uh, what I did know is that I was drowning in my own blood, um, and I lost over half the blood in my body. Um, and basically, it was a little. Sc I won't kid you. It was scary. I, I didn't really feel any pain until after the biopsy, but the first two weeks. Um, gave me a lot of time to think about what was really, really important. And I was able to kind of, uh, I guess, realign my my values and my objectives. And it was, uh, you know, but I will say this, that when when the doctors would ask me, like, you know, where, you know, because it was environmental exposure. Apparently, I was exposed to a chemical of some sort that actually ate away the lining of my lungs, as crazy as that sound. It's called diffuse alveolar hemorrhaging, by the way, for those that uh, are listening and can Google that. Um, but... Uh, the, the weird part about it is that I, they, they would ask me, like, you know, uh, you know, where have you been? And I said, well, I was in Detroit. And then all the doctors would go, oh, OK. Like and then they wouldn't ask me any more questions. So uh, <laughs> I was like, wait a second. That's not that's not really fair to Detroit. There was absolutely nothing wrong with Detroit. I'm pretty sure it was something when I got home. Most people think my wife was trying to poison me. Oh, God, um, that's not very nice. <laughs> well, she is really nice. And that's the long con that she's playing, you know. And I kept telling her in the hospital, I said, you realize if you let me die, you get 100 percent. If I live, the best you can do is 50, sweetheart. And uh, and the odd, odd thing, though, is that half my friends uh, uh, called her up and and uh, told her they would help her hide my body. And the other half uh, offered her an alibi. So I'm um, not exactly sure what's going on there, but uh, I'm just going to I'm just going to continue to be really, really nice to her. Well, you survived, which is the important thing. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> I, I just want to throw that out there. You survived any attempts on murder, so everything's fine. <laughs> thus far. Yeah, thus far, exactly. And you got through Detroit, which sometimes, you know, people say Detroit is really scary. My mom is terrified that I go to Detroit every year for Yomacon. And she's like, don't get stabbed. Don't walk alone anywhere. And I'm, I've actually never been in a situation in, in Detroit or at Yomacon where I felt unsafe and i live in vegas and vegas is, i guess isn't the safest place in the world but i guess i'm used to it <laughs> i gotta tell you i i was very impressed with the people of detroit and uh incredibly nice uh folks um and you know coming from texas where i've grown up most of my life uh the uh you know we have the southern hospitality thing down here i found the same in detroit and it was really really cool and amazing so uh i think detroit gets a bad rap for whatever reason um, but, uh, the reality is, is, you know, it's not Windsor, <laughs> <laughs> which is across the river. Never mind. Anyway, um, nobody's making fun of any city in Canada here, except for a few of them. But, uh, the, uh, the reality is, is that Detroit was absolutely fantastic. And I'm looking forward to continuing to go back, uh, not only for Yomacon, but also the next, uh, Midwest media expo that they have there as well. Wonderful. Well, now the fans know where they can catch you in the future. <laughs> absolutely. 
But for the listeners there who might be a little bit unfamiliar with your career, um, obviously Claptrap didn't come before Borderlands, but you entered into the game industry um, way before that. So could you explain kind of your origins? Sure. Um, A lot of people ask me how to get in the game industry, and I tell them that the best way is to do it like I did. Just have one of your best friends start one of the big game companies here in the area and have them pull you in. And uh, so all you got to do is go find a best friend that starts a game company. Pretty easy, right, folks? The the reality is, is that I was in a different career. Uh, I was living in the Cayman Islands. I came home, uh, moved back to Texas, and um, I got a I was given a copy of Quake. Um, uh, Adrian Carmack, one of the founders of id, gave me a copy of Quake uh, a week before it came out. And I uh, went out and bought my first uh, PC to play the game. I had missed out on Doom because I was living abroad, but, uh, but Quake just changed everything. So um, my best friend started a company called Ritual Entertainment. They were doing Quake Mission Pack number one, the Scourge of Armagon. And I would go over to his house um, where they had first offices uh, where they had their office, and I would, uh, I would uh, play test the maps. And so we were just playing a lot of deathmatch and so on. And, you know, they needed a little help here and there on things. And so I would write them a press release or I, I, I basically became an honorary board member. And so they kept trying to bring me on board and I kept telling him that they didn't need me, but they needed more artists or they needed more programmers and more level designers and so on. And uh, so I, I turned them down for about a year, year and a half. And then uh, Harry Miller and Mike Wilson started a company called Gathering and Developers and asked me if I would consider joining them. And I, th- I felt that I could apply my skill set a little bit better on the publishing side at that time than I could on the development side. So back in 98, I joined Gathering of Developers, uh, also known as God Games. And when we sold uh, the company to Take Two, uh, they turned it into what's called 2K Games, which, which is a publisher that we work with right now, as a matter of fact. So I was one of the <laughs> original executives at 2K Games. It's amazing how small this industry is. It's a very small industry, which is very, you know, people should realize how small it is because uh, you can build a reputation when you're very, very young and it can be stuck with you for the rest of your life if you're going to work in this industry. And so um, it, what, what's terrible about that is a lot of us were in our early 20s, uh, you know, when, when we were getting in or, or, or so on. And we were, we were, um, Maybe a little bit, uh, certainly younger, and maybe a little bit more dumb back then. And and sometimes we let our feelings get in the way. I'm not talking about. I'm saying our the the royal we, if you will. But um, you know, it, we were a little bit. We were immature back then, and uh, we could do that because the budgets were much much smaller. You know, back then a million and a half dollar budget was a pretty big budget. You know, uh, Max Payne was ha- originally had like a two million dollar budget, and and. Uh, we uh, when it ballooned to like four million, we were like, I don't know if we're ever going to make our money back on this thing at all. You know, how do we sell that many copies of games? But um, so anyway, so when Gathering of Developers um, was sold, I uh, started a toy company called Radioactive Clown, where I did the very first Call of Duty action figures uh, with my friends over at Plan B. I did the uh, Unreal tournament action figures, Rune and America's Army, and I did a lot other, a lot of others that never actually um, made it to the shelf because um, by the time that uh, the game would come out, it, you know, you can't always pick the winners. Uh, sometimes it was just easier to, to kill the whole line than it was to uh, continue to produce them and, and try to get them out. But I was learning. I didn't know how to make toys, so I, I was spending, uh, you know, millions of dollars of somebody else's money <laughs> to figure it out. Well, that's and, the way to do it, though. <laughs> it, you know, it's a lot better than spending your own money. Um, but, uh, in a way I, I'm very thankful for the people that believed in me, uh, at that time. Fortunately, I've, I've been able to take that, uh, the, the lessons that I learned there and, and apply that to some of the things that I'm doing here at Gearbox. So uh, about nine years ago, I was at a party, uh, one of the happy hours that I threw around here in Dallas for our, the Dallas gaming mafia, where all the, you know, different developers from different companies would come and drink. And Randy and I are talking and he asked me if I would ever consider working uh, with him at Gearbox and. So let me think about it, and he asked me what I might want to do, and kind of made my own job. So um, I've been here for almost nine years, and uh, you know, and that whole toy thing uh, has, has come in handy because we're actually making some uh, some some uh, collectible merchandise over here as well. And yeah. I'm not going to announce all the stuff that we're doing, but uh, we're in the process. You'll see some really cool stuff coming from Gearbox. Um, here in you know pretty soon in regards to collectible merchandise <laughs> well what's really cool is uh, you know a lot of people don't necessarily think about when they think about toys they think action figures 
Mm -hmm. But some of the stuff you've done, like you went to China to help build the loot chest for the Borderlands 2 Collector's Editions. Yeah, that's right. That's right. I was, uh, in fact, I was in China at the factory uh, working with the factory to make sure they got it just right when uh, 2K decided to, to uh, take pre-orders on the uh, on the loot chest. Yeah. And I got a an email from a friend of mine over at NVIDIA asking if I could hook him up with a loot chest. And I was like, that's a weird question. One, how do you know about it? Two, yeah, no problem, man. I, I got you hooked up. You know, you're a bud. And then, uh, and then I told him, I was like, look, I'm going to be back in about 10 days. Let's talk about it then. I get back to the States. And, and, and actually, Chris, it was you that told me. You're like, yeah, we sold out in two days. And I'm like, yeah. what do you mean sold out? He's like, we, we, got, we, we pre-sold uh, 60,000 units. And I was like, well, why did we cut it off? We, we could have just continued <laughs> to give everybody one if they wanted one. And um, that, was a, that was a decision to keep it limited at the time. But Yeah, the, um, I think there are also con concerns about delivery dates, whether or not we could uh, deliver anymore. Like, people would be waiting months after launch for a collector. Right, right. Yeah, there's only so much that you can get on a boat, I guess, right, And yeah. uh, to get over here in time. But uh, it was a huge success, and that kind of showed um, – showed us over here at Gearbox that, you know, we can, we can do this stuff. And, and I have that skill set. Uh, at least I, at least I have about five years of experience doing that. So still plenty to learn, but, uh, but anyway, yeah, it's, it's a lot of fun, you know? And so we're, we're, we did some more loot chess. Uh, we have, we may even have some more surprises in that regard there, but also some things like action figures and, uh, statues and, and, uh, you know, maybe even some lunch boxes and things like that. That would be really, really cool. Uh, can you imagine having a, a uh, you know, Gage's lunchbox uh, that she has in the game, actually having that actual lunchbox, maybe some other designs too? We'll see, you know. That would be a lot of fun. And I will have to say, as a gamer, I do appreciate you guys cutting it off to make sure you get delivery dates. I recently had a really horrible run-in with an exclusive 3DS, and it was a mess. And I got sent two, and I got sent the game twice, and I had to return it and walk it. Like, you know, it was not a simple process at all. You get sent two. It's like, hey, free 3DS. Yeah, they they charged me twice. Oh, well, <laughs> after that's, that's, they delayed it. <laughs> tell you what, next time that happens, you let me know. Was I'll that, have you make some phone calls. Is that the Disney one? Yes, it was. It was the 3DS uh, Mickey Mouse one. It, it's a Walmart exclusive, and I'm never using Walmart.com again. <laughs> I think your first, yeah. Um, that was the first issue. <laughs> my goodness. Well, I'm sorry that you had such a terrible time with that, but you know. Uh, thankfully, that wasn't us. <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> just if you ever do use Walmart, just smack them a few times to make sure they do it right. <laughs> you got it. I'll do that if I ever if I am ever over there. Perfect. <laughs> so, uh, so you asked about me getting into the industry. So I've been doing this for like I don't know, 16 years now, yeah. um, officially in the industry, uh, having been around and like I said, an honorary board member of Ritual Entertainment for you know a year and a half before I even got in. Um, and, uh, you know, that, that was, uh, that was interesting. So I've been around this for a long time. Um, and only in the last, you know, four years, uh, has Claptrap even been a thing. Right. And it's really weird because, you know, I feel like I've, I've tried to build a good reputation in this industry of being a great, uh, biz guy, a guy that can create value, uh, that can come in and, and, and really do some, some, uh, some great things for a company. Um, and when I get, when I introduce myself as, you know, the biz guy at Gearbox, a lot of times people just kind of like, oh, hey, that's nice, you know, and they kind of like, they're already looking and scanning the room or whatever. And then, you know, somebody right next to me may say, uh, well, you know, he's also the voice of Claptrap. And then all of a sudden they're just like, oh my God, that's amazing. And I'm like, I never get that reaction from just the biz guy thing. And that would, I'm, I'm so disappointed about that. So um, I might have to start putting Claptrap on my briefcase or something like that, just to kind of mix the two a little we bit. Can, we can make you a mask. There you go. It's well, like it's, a voice changer that I can carry around with me. That would be great. I yeah. do think one of the interesting things is that you don't often, at least in the in the past ten years, it seems like more developers or more people a part of the biz side aren't lending their voices. You know, you're you're getting out and you're renting a studio or an agent or you're hiring an agency and you're hiring voice actors. So I think it's really interesting that you got involved <laughs> with that character. Well, it's it's typecasting, quite frankly. Um, <laughs> I, uh, <laughs> that, that, hopefully that's, that's taken as a joke. Um, you can ask my coworkers, but, um, you know, what's prior to getting in the game industry, one of the things that I had done is, uh, you know, I mentioned I, I was living down in the Caribbean and the Cayman Islands 
And uh, when I uh, came back and got my first copy of Quake, well, I was doing radio down there for Z99. So I was doing some character voices for like our whenever I would do weather. I had a character that did that. Uh, I would do character voices for uh, for bits for the morning show. Um, now, when I was doing my news and sports, I had to, you know, sound like a news guy or a sports guy. But uh, but, you know, just for the, the morning show itself and weather and stuff like that, we could have a lot of fun with different things. So when I when uh, when Ritual was making Sin, uh, they asked me to to help out. And, and I, I did a number of voices in that game. None of the major characters or anything like that, but uh, spent a number of hours in the studio doing uh, voices for them uh, just because they're my buds and, uh, you know, didn't take a dime for it. Um, so I actually still have my amateur uh, voice actor status uh uh, going on because I have yet to be paid specifically to do voices in games, and I've I've done voices in games like Tropico. I've done a lot of the God Games uh, stuff. If there was any filler uh, stuff that needed to be done in our studio, there we would you know I would step in and do some of that. And then even when I got here to, to Gearbox, uh, doing some stuff in Brothers in Arms, uh, other games, and then you know there was this little robot that we were thinking about adding, and it was supposed to be like some little bit of comedy relief. Um, and nobody thought it was going to be big at all. You know, it was quite a surprise for everybody. I think if they had known that they definitely would not have asked me to be a part of it. So, (laughs) um, the problem now is, is that they're stuck with me, right? Because they're, you know, how do you ever fire claptrap, right? From gearbox, right? So it's, ah, I, uh, I I think he'd have to fire himself. Probably, probably so. I know that the the day that Claptrap gets cut from the game or loses his voice or they get another voice actor, then my days are numbered here. So, um, but uh, that's it's all a joke, obviously. I, uh, I I love it here. We're a big family, but uh, uh, I feel very honored, quite frankly, that I get to even contribute creatively to the process and that it's turned out the way that it has. Uh, it is um, it is it is very humbling to be a part of that. It's a big part of the development process too. Like at various points in the game. A bunch of people around the studio will have their voices in it just as temporary placeholders. You know, before we get the big actors in, we want to make sure that we've got the timing down, that we know what lines are in there. And sometimes that voice work is just so good that it ends up making it into final. It doesn't get replaced. Yeah, it's, I'm not the only one uh, in the office that, that does voice work here. Uh, Mikey Newman is the voice of Scooter. Yeah. Uh, Randy is the voice of, uh, of Crazy Earl. Uh, and uh, Mark Forsyth, I know, has done a few things. Rayson Varner has done a number of, of uh, voices, the Bandits, and and I, isn't he Krieg as well? Is that him? No, it was someone else was Krieg, but but they basically based it on his performance for the other Bandits, right? Mm-hmm. You know, so and, yeah, uh, Bunker Boss uh, was uh, Josh Davidson, right? There's Anthony Birch was Handsome Jack's clone. Oh, right on, uh, right on. Uh, and, and Anthony's sister, even though she's not an employee at Gearbox, is, you know, she's she's part of the family. So yeah. Ashley did Tiny Tina. She did an amazing job with that. So beloved that she got her own DLC. <laughs> I know, right? Oh. So, yeah, you can see just the way we talk about things. Uh, you know, it's easy for us to just spiral off into topics. No, I think that's perfect because a lot of us are, I want to say, are voice acting hunters. Like a new game will come out and it's like, there's no cast list anywhere. Are they, like, NDA the cast list, so nobody's going to get to it until you get to the credits. And then sometimes the cast list isn't in the credits. People are like, who is who? And the internet has to figure it out. And a lot of us on staff and a lot of the fans actually do that for a lot of games. We try and figure out, okay, who does that sound like? So if it's somebody from the studio, we have no idea who it is. Well, I tell you what, if uh, if if your listeners are big voice actor fans and they follow voice actors, I, let me tell you a little bit of a little story because I think this is just really funny. I went to high school with Kyle Abair and also Brian Massey. Now, I don't know if you know who Brian Massey or Kyle yeah, are. Yeah, we, we, we've talked to him, and I actually just saw Kyle at uh, uh, Subicon. We were at the same convention together. Okay. So Kyle and I, and Brian and Kyle and I, uh, have been friends uh, since high school. We've, we've known each other. We've, we've been good friends since then. And we, we would do little, uh, little projects uh, with another friend of ours, David Maddox. I was talking to Todd Habercorn uh, just the other day, and he was like, you know David Maddox and Brian Massey and, and, and Kyle Avery? I'm like, yeah, I know those guys. Like, We all went to high school together. We've we've known each other, and we've been very close for many, many, many years. Uh, and it just blew his mind, you know? And, and uh, to me, it's really cool, because I, I got to do Yomacon. Uh, Kyle was there. And, uh, you know, it just kind of, uh, you know, we, we both had very different paths to get to the same panel if you will. And, uh, uh, we were, you know, North Mesquite represent kind of thing, but, uh, 
uh, it's pretty crazy that uh, we've we've all done kind of a, a thing and and we get to be recognized for it. You know, it's really cool. That is such a small world. I don't think anybody could have predicted that would happen. <laughs> No, well, you know, other people that we went to high school with were like uh, David Aberzies, the uh, drummer uh, for Pearl Jam. Um, and uh, let's see, uh, I mentioned uh, David Maddox. He's a he's a filmmaker. Uh, there's There's been some other other folks that have kind of had their claim to fame. But, you know, what's really funny is that id Software moved right next door to the high school that we graduated from, uh, like the year or two after I graduated there. Uh, and so, <laughs> you know, this is how I knew Adrian Carmack, because his wife, uh, uh, Amy, went to um went to mesquite high school <laughs> so so yeah you want a connection in the industry you want a job just go to school with some of the some of the people that helped create it P- piece of cake right yep. you just have to predict that maybe if you have a time machine it would go faster but you know oh, it's... <laughs> that's what we got to do next the industry is constantly changing and evolving and it's always interesting to see the vectors that people take okay. to get into it definitely yeah, and- I tell people that if you want to do something in games, uh, you know, you just just do it. Um, you have to learn how to add value or create value, and you can't expect people to give you a job in order to learn how to do that. You have to learn how to do that on your own. Put your put your ten thousand hours in, if you will. Yeah. Um, and you don't really, ha- you know, I, I just created my uh, a new topic here, but you don't really have to go uh, to to school for for this sort of thing. Uh, you know, I, I tell people, you know, Van Gogh didn't have to didn't need to go to school to be a painter. Neither do you. Uh, you don't have to go to school to be a programmer. Now, maybe some people need instruction. Maybe they need a teacher there um, to help them. But the ones that we find that work here that are really that, that uh, were successful enough to get to Gearbox are folks that were just self-starters. They just did it anyway. Yeah. Well, yeah. to be fair, I mean, at that time, they also didn't have the degrees and the programs that we have now. Very true. And and we are part of the uh, Guild Hall at SMU. Uh, we we yeah. help uh, with that curriculum, uh, actually. And uh mm-hmm. Uh, we actually have a program where folks can uh, intern here at Gearbox, the uh, the best of their um, of their upcoming uh, graduates, yeah. and we give them a, an opportunity to come in and do something. At least get Gearbox on their resume so that they can, you know, springboard into something else. Yeah. But um, uh, so we do work with with folks that are getting degrees in in uh, game development, but you know, it's not necessary either. Uh, certainly. Oh uh, no, that's not the only way. Yeah, not that's at all. Not the- like the best thing ever, so many people write to us and they ask, you know, how can I get in? What can I do? I really want to start programming. Can I, can I do this? And they seem to be asking for permission to pursue their right. dreams. Right. And, and they want somebody to say, yes, go do it. And the only person that can tell you to do that is yourself. Yep. Like, yes, I'm going to go do that. And then when you come to a company, you don't say, I have an idea. You say, look at all, look at what I can do. Exactly. Yeah. Because everybody has ideas, but not as many people can follow. It is, that is a, a, a very common misconception that people uh, – we actually have a saying here at Gearbox that ideas are not precious uh, or that no idea is precious. Uh, people often come to us and say, I have a great idea for a game. We should do this. And so I'm like, great. Uh, save that idea. Go go make that, you know, uh, mm-hmm. um, and, and good luck with that. But I'll, I, I remind them that, you know, out of the 250 people here at Gearbox, uh, we have – about 5,000 ideas <laughs> and because everybody has 20 in their back pocket, right? And uh, But yet you have to get people to pour their passions uh, and their time and energy into one idea at a time. And so that's why we, we say ideas are not precious and we build consensus around ideas. Uh, but, you know, a lot of times people think that, that uh, having a game idea is what's going to get them in the industry. And the reality is, is having skill to make games is what's going to get you in the industry. Well, having skill to do whatever it is you want to do. So if it's creating a level, being experienced in a level editor and having levels you can point to. If it's being a voice actor, it's having a demo reel showcasing different characters. Yep. And those can be existing characters. You know, you can show me your Naruto. Mm-hmm. You can show me what your clap trap would sound like so I can get an idea of where that goes. Yep. Of course, we know that anybody else's clap trap is going to sound like crap, but um, let's just be honest. Let's be honest here. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I mean, there's there's no harm in having, you know, an entire choir of clap traps. How else are we going to do the singing album? <laughs> well, you know, I like to sing a little bit. I could do that a hundred different times. Anyway, um, the uh, for those that are that are trying to get in the gaming industry, that's a that's a desire of theirs. I, I say, if you want to if you want to program, uh, you know, program something, uh, create a, a total conversion. Uh, create a mod of some sort. If you want to be an animator, then animate uh, existing characters. Uh, do your own animations. If you want to build models, 
do that. If you want to, if you want to create environments, do that. You know, it's, there's so many different aspects of, of uh, game development that we need a lot of very talented people from composers to artists to uh, programmers. You know, I mean, we, we have some, it's amazing. I, I walk around our office here and everybody is way smarter than me. <laughs> and um, I like it that way. Right. Because if, if, if I'm the smartest guy, then we're making really crappy games. <laughs> well, even even though that I'm not in the game industry, I can really relate with what you guys are saying. For example, we started 91.8 The Fan uh, four years ago, and we had really no examples to go off of. Nobody else uh, was actually paying the artist directly, you know, royalties, especially artists that were overseas online. So I, I can relate to that because this path has kind of led me to some amazing connections and uh, to dabble in voice work myself. So it's been a lot of fun. And so when people approach our table or our booth, I kind of just tell them you need to do it. You need to actually it, not think about doing it. You need to actually go and do it. <laughs> I, I agree. I agree with that statement wholeheartedly. You know, what's interesting, though, about the voice acting side is I've never experienced the struggle that uh, other voice actors have. Uh, I've, I've never um, had to go and, and really, you know, try out for a role, if you will. Uh, and, and quite frankly, I've, I've never, you know, been uh, rejected. Uh, for her role either. So my, you know, the experience that I have is, is quite different. Of course, I've also never been paid for it. So <laughs> it, it's, uh, uh, yeah, I imagine if I was, uh, if I was trying to go get other uh, roles or something like that, I, w I would feel that. I feel for the, 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 the folks that are, uh, you know, trying to be voice actors in anime or in, uh, in video games, because it's, it's not easy and it can be oh. difficult sometimes for people to, um, it can be really difficult for people to uh, experience that rejection. And, uh, and you know, it's not their fault, right? Sometimes they're just not right for that particular part. And, or there's somebody that just nails it, right? Um, and I can imagine how tough that can be, uh, you know, I, I, but fortunately I haven't had to experience that myself, yeah, so. Even like, you know, in our field, we talk with a bunch of different people. Right. And we know a large swath of individuals from all different aspects of entertainment. And I'll sit and talk with somebody, and they'll be like, yeah, you know, I did this show, I did this, uh, I was on this, my career's in the toilet, it's the worst. Like, <laughs> they lack all perspective, because they're so close to it, right? that you don't realize how great and, like, out there you are, because you just have your own perceptions of things. I'm doing a terrible job articulating this point, but it's, well, don't get caught in your own head. Yeah, and fair enough, and, and you know it takes a while to get to the point where you can make a living at anything that you love doing. Right. And, and what I tell people is, you know, uh, do what you love and the money will eventually uh, happen. And, um, at, at the very least you're getting to do your hobby. Uh, but you know, I would never tell anybody to go quit their job to become an actor either. You know, it's like, why don't you try out while you've got a job? That might be the better way to do it. Or take classes while you have a job. Exactly. You know, do something to, 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 uh, uh, you know, further your goal. Because those classes aren't cheap. I'm just going to throw that out there. <laughs> Never taken one of those classes. Uh, maybe you could teach me some things. <laughs> Possibly, maybe. Probably not. I think you're better th than me at being... Uh... Uh, oh, I think you're being kind and you're completely wrong. But um, <laughs> but thank you very much. That's very nice of you to say. Well, for the listeners out there, obviously, I know you guys can't talk about it at um, extensively because it was just announced. But I believe on April 9th, you guys announced Borderlands, uh, the pre-sequel, which I'm sure you guys are very excited about. Well, we are. We're, we are very excited about that. It's, uh, you know, we, we love playing Borderlands here, uh, you know, at Gearbox ourselves, too. And um, it's it's really neat that uh, so many other folks have they, that so many other folks dig what we do. And and we feel like we're all, you know, part of that fan group. Um, you know, the reason that we made Borderlands is because a lot of us wanted to have a, a role playing shooter that we just there was just no role playing shooters. That we, I'm, I'm a first person shooter gamer myself. I told you I. You know, I got my first PC with Quake. Uh, that's kind of games I love to play. And so all these great role-playing games out there, I just wasn't really attracted to and because it wasn't first person. And so um, we kind of saw that there was uh, something missing there, and we decided to create it ourselves. And, um, you know, we it, lo and behold, it turned out to be a lot of fun. And for me, for being in this industry for so long, one of the things that I notice is when I walk around uh, a development studio and people – are playing uh, the game they've been working on for the last couple of years, and they're playing it on their own time for fun, that's when you know you have a really special thing, right? 
that's when you know that that that's a fun game. And I saw that with uh, with Quake uh, uh, in the mission packs. I saw that with the game called Rune, which was a really, really, really fun game by Human Head uh, that we published at Gathering Developers. I, I saw that with uh, with Max Payne and uh, and certainly uh, saw that with with Borderlands. Really, really cool to, to see that, you know, just walking around before anybody even knows that, you know, that there's a thing called Borderlands and, and, and we're, we're having a lot of fun uh, playing co-op. Um, so, you know, the reaction was, has been incredible. Uh, you know, the first game, it was the success there was, I think, uh, because of the word of mouth for people buying it and then recruiting three of their friends to buy it as well. And uh, we ended up um, creating more DLC because people were just asking us for more content, right? More and more, you know, we did. We did the four campaign add-ons. Yeah. We did new characters. Krieg was one of those ones where, with Borderlands 2, like, Krieg was one of the ones where the, the team really wanted to do it, but they weren't sure if anybody would be interested. Right. And every day they're like, oh, man, I really don't know. And one of the guys just started prototyping them one day. It was, just, it was crazy. And now you think about it, uh, like, you look back, and it's like over a year of Borderlands 2 content, and then we did the Headhunter packs just crazy the amount of stuff that's it's yeah, what, 18 months i think of post-release support we, we're breaking records for being able to create dlc and um i know i know there's a lot of mixed feelings about what dlc is and so on and and the way that i that we look at it over here is it's a lot easier to give people more content that they can download and not have you know than it is to actually have to go and and uh, and, and and collect it all spend years collecting it and then putting it on a shelf right. and Putting it on physical media and so on, um, but you know it's it's I, I, I get it. Some some people feel like they're missing something if they buy a full game and then they don't buy any DLC later on. If they played it to their heart's content, they're not missing anything at all. Uh, but if they want to play more, then uh, and they want to play and their friends want to play more with them, then then we're the kind of company that will actually provide more content. And you know we don't. It's weird. People want to complain sometimes about day one DLC, and that's something that Gearbox has never, ever, ever done, or cutting content from the game. Yeah. And I know that there have been publishers and developers that have done uh, really shitty, really crappy stuff like that, and I hope you can bleep that, and I apologize. Um, but, you know, we're, again, we're, we're fans ourselves. We're gamers, too. And, you know, we don't start working on DLC until after we go gold with, uh, with the full game, and because uh, we got to get it out on time, too. Well, that makes me really happy to hear that because as a gamer, this is a personal opinion. This has nothing to do with 91.8 The Fan. But day one DLC does kind of bother me because I'm like, oh, there's already DLC out. But yeah. I don't even know if I like the game yet. Like, I just popped the game in and it's already telling me, hey, there's DLC if you want to get it. So that that to me kind of is it's a wrong. little off-putting. It's wrong. Right. Yeah. Out, just yeah. flat out it's wrong. That's exploiting the customer. We are completely against that. Well, I appreciate that mentality, and I'm sure the fans do too. I think uh, a lot of people really respect that. Yeah, we're all about uh, increasing the value, you know, and we want to make it so, you know, 10 years ago, uh, well, no, excuse me, 15 years ago when Gearbox started, uh, the first game out of Gearbox was Half-Life Opposing Force. It is what nowadays would be considered yeah. a DLC expansion. Yeah, we, we called those expansion packs back then, yeah. and, uh, you know, even... My buddies, when I was first in the Quake Mission Pack number one, the expansion pack got a, the expansion pack of the year award, whatever, right? <laughs> well, we don't have expansion packs anymore. It's called DLC. That's exactly yeah. what it is. People weren't angry about expansion packs back then. Mm -hmm. People tend to get kind of angry well, about DLC at times. It's when it's, it's when it's already there, and it's and it's all up to the business people. You know, they say, well, this was developed using a separate budget, so we can't. You can get the license, and there are technical reasons and. Well, I think the Ultimately. only genre that gets away with expansions nowadays is technically fighter games, quote unquote. Well, maybe, yeah. I you know, I, I think it just kind of depends on the on the game. But really, it's the it's the customers, quite frankly. I think that demand DLC, and you know, when your when your customers are saying we want more, we want more. Um, you know, I think that I think it's our responsibility to 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 give them more. Definitely. And now for the listeners out there, um, for them who want to keep up to date with what you guys are doing, or whether, uh, Dave, your your vocal career or clap track chap career, I should say, uh, where can they follow you guys online? You know, Facebook, Twitter, all that fun stuff. All right. Well, uh, I am at David Eddings uh, on Twitter. Uh, I just recently uh, even kind of got my Twitter thing going. Uh, and that was primarily because I was in the hospital and uh, our CEO, Randy Pitchford, 
uh, wanted to show me the power of, uh, of Twittersphere and, and how that would help my healing process. So he got me to, um, to kind of set it all up and then uh, put it out there. And, and all the love and support that I received from uh, fans and friends and loved ones um, was amazing and really helped me get through that, that really tough uh, time. Uh, so I've been hooked on it ever since. Uh, you can also find me on Facebook. Um, I, I, uh, you can, you know, it's, I'm David Eddings, uh, on Facebook. I know there's prob there's like, um, there's a huge, uh, like fan page for my cousin, the fantasy author. Uh, but he never used Facebook. So you're never going to, and he, unfortunately he's not around anymore. Uh, may he rest in peace. But, um, but yeah, you can find me on Facebook. You can find me on Twitter just by put typing in David Eddings. And I think that's all I've got personally. Now, uh, as far as Gearbox is concerned, we have uh, we have a Facebook page, the official Gearbox uh, uh, Facebook page. We mm -hmm. have uh, the official uh, Gearbox uh, Twitter. Yeah, both uh, are uh, Twitter.com and Facebook.com slash Gearbox Software. And then uh, there's a bunch of other ones. You know, there's Borderlands-centric ones. There's EchoCast for Borderlands characters. Yep. But those are the main ones, and you'll be able to find the rest from there. Perfect. And now we know where to stalk you at events in a nice way. Um, <laughs> hopefully oh, I, nobody oh, blocks you so hard it gets you back in the hospital. <laughs> yeah. That would be bad. <laughs> well, like I said, I love my stalkers, each and every one of them. All and you know, and you know who you are. <laughs> yeah, they're probably listening right now. <laughs> Typing away in our live chat, asking questions. <laughs> but for the fans out there, we actually have a 91.8 The Fan tradition, and I was curious if you guys would be willing to participate. Sure. sure. Uh, what is the tradition? Basically, we ask if you'd be willing to do a radio bump for us or say a specific line for us. Uh, what would that line be? It's, it's not offensive, I promise. It's just, hello, my name is, you insert your name, I do this. You can insert characters you do or your job at Gearbox, whatever you want to put there. And you're tuned into 91.8, the fan. Right. <clears throat> you want to you want to each uh, you want to no, have us each do one? It's just you. Okay, it's all right. Oh, he, he's, he's like, nope, I don't want to be involved. <laughs> all right, Chris. All right, well, then, uh, then I'll do one. Um, hi, this is David Eddings, vice president at Gearbox and the voice of Claptrap and TK Baja. And you are listening to 91.8, the fan. See, that was perfect. That was awesome. I would have screwed I, that up in at least four different ways. <laughs> I, can, I can do a different one for you later on if you want. So If it makes you feel better, for, you know, we've had voice actors on. We've had, like, there's at least 200 who have been given the line and they mess it up live on air. So uh, don't well, feel bad. <laughs> I, can, I can do one in the studio and we can uh, process it so that uh, it sounds more like Claptrap, you know. It's like, you know, hello, travelers. This is Claptrap and you're listening to 91.8 The Fan or... Something like that, but, you know, pitched up slightly so that it sounds more like Claptrap. Well, that would be glorious, and I have to say thank you guys for being on today. You had a lot of insightful information on the business. Is there anything else you'd want to tell the listeners out there? Um, you know, just keep playing games and have fun, and, and uh, if it's something that you think that you want to do, then uh, please, uh, you know, gain the skills that you need to, uh, to do just that. Follow your heart and follow your dream. Keep on trucking. <laughs> keep on keeping on <laughs> oh there you go well no thank you guys so much well thank you very much for having me on and for any of the listeners out there that missed any of this interview don't fret you can find it on the website within the next few days so keep your eyes peeled to 918thefan.com and your ears tuned to 91.8 the fan where we play everything you want and nothing you don't <laughs>